the effects of these things begin in the theological seminaries and then they trickle down into the churches. So if there is a trend, as an example, that would take place in a theological seminary and be damaging there, it will cause more damage when the trickle-down effect finally reaches the churches. And the full extent of that trickle-down effect may not be felt in the churches for one generation or more, but indeed it will be felt. Why, why the discussion, the ongoing discussion of Calvinism? Because in recent years, this emphasis has entered some of the churches. Now, here's my burden. A lot of men will say, well, so-and-so believes it, and so-and-so believes it, and so-and-so believes it, so I must believe it too, without ever really looking at the foundation of some of the doctrine. In addition, many, many men do not understand that the tenets of Calvinism as taught currently by contemporary Calvinists are not only uh, misinterpretations of the Scripture, but many times, as we're going to see tonight, they are doctrines that are outright denials of the Bible. None of the points of Calvinism as they are defined by contemporary Calvinists, and we will bring those definitions to bear in a moment, none of those points are actually found taught in the Scripture, and most of them are a logical extension of having accepted one or more of the others. So tonight we're on the third point of Calvinism. Calvinism, limited atonement. Did Christ die for the whole world? This evening we're going to the, address the issue as, essentially as this. The efficacy of the atoning work of Christ, to what extent is Christ's work efficacious? Did Jesus Christ die for the sins of the whole world? Right away my audience is saying, well, you know, Pastor, of course He did. And I'm saying that with you. You know why I'm saying that with you? Because the Bible says that He did. Now, I don't want to shock or amaze this evening, but as I studied into this, I found that there is a whole branch of professing Christendom that not only doesn't believe that Christ died for the whole world, but believes very strongly that Christ died only for a few, and that the blood of Jesus Christ is only effective for a few. Now, let me make this practical, because I like to put it down to brass tacks. These folks, by the way, tend to be ivory tower scholars, most of these Calvinists do. I like to put it down to brass tacks. Whereas you won't see R.C. Sproul coming down to Good News Ministries mission down here on Washington and Rural Street the first Saturday of the month. He just won't show up there. I, I do go down there. And when I preach at the Good News Mission, there are maybe 60 or 70 men sometimes, depending on the weather, crowded into that little gospel chapel. And I preach to those men, and some of them, doubtless on any given night, some of them will be first-timers at the Gospel Mission. For some, it will be the first time that they have ever heard the Gospel. And as I'm preaching at Good News Ministries, this preacher will stand before that bedraggled congregation and will look out upon them and will say to them these words, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be there. If I didn't believe that every person in that audience, regardless of who they are, that every person in that audience can make a decision to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and be saved, and that when Jesus died on Calvary's cross, He died for every individual in that audience, and that not one person in that audience is in any way excluded from the potential of the efficacy of Christ if He will meet the condition of faith. When I stand before that audience, I preach Christ died for all. But you say, Pastor Monty, this is very um, basic. It is unless you accept the doctrines we're talking about tonight. And this particular one, the concept of limited atonement. Now, let's see, pick on Rick over here. Rick is unable to be saved. There's nothing he can do. I can, he's not, let's pretend Rick is not one of the chosen, okay? Rick is not one of the elect. He's, he, he missed the boat somewhere in eternity past. Rick can sit here, according to that doctrine, he can sit here and listen to me preach the gospel time and time again, and he couldn't be saved if he wanted to be. Truth is, he wouldn't want to be. But he's unable. He couldn't be. There is no possible way he can listen but cannot be saved. This guy over here, he will be saved. He has been born again before he got saved and eventually will receive Christ as his personal Savior. There is nothing he can do. He's going to receive Christ. He's not going to receive Christ. Now, 
that has been determined, according to the Calvinists, from eternity past. Okay? You are damned. You're going to heaven. And so the Calvinist says, based upon that, since this was determined in eternity past, there is no reason for Christ to have died for the sins of the whole world. The Calvinist says He didn't die for everyone's sins. He did not die for Rick's sins because Rick wasn't chosen. And Rick is unable to choose Christ. He wasn't chosen. He's never been born again in order that he might be saved sometime in the future. Therefore, Christ didn't die for him. Christ only died for the elect and for the church. That is essentially their teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, may I say it kindly, that is heresy of the first rank. Now, A.A. A. Hodge, quote, If they, the critics of Calvinism, could prove that the love which prompted God to give His Son to die as a sin offering had for its objects all men, in other words, if they could prove God loved everybody, that Christ actually sacrificed His life with the purpose of saving all on the condition of faith, then the central principle of Arminianism is true. Put the word true there. That's A.A. A. Hodge. And then by default, Calvinism is false. As, as I added that in there. But by default, Calvinism is false. A.A. A. Hodge said if you could prove that God loved everybody and that Christ died for the sins of everybody, then Calvinism's in trouble and Arminianism is true. Uh, but the central idea is this. Is it true that God loves everybody? Is that true? Yes, that's true. Absolutely. Again, I defer to preaching down at Good News Ministries. You see, a lot of people have this theology up here, and they'll sit in a classroom somewhere with a fine point of their pencil sharpened, ready to dot all their theological I's and cross all their theological T's, and they'll never think of how it affects people. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. When I'm standing in front of a congregation at Good News Ministries, I can point to those fellows and say, I don't know all about you. I don't know the sins that you've committed. I don't know what has brought you to this point in your life. But fellows, there's one thing I can say about each and every one of you. There are no exclusions. God loves each and every one. And I can say that in all honesty, and I can say it on the authority of the Bible. And if I could not say that, I would not bother to go down to the mission. I would not bother to preach to that crowd if I could not honestly tell them that God loves every one of them. The Bible says it's so. I can honestly tell them that Christ died for every one of them. The Bible says it's so. So Hodge says that if you deny the concept of limited atonement, you have undermined all of Calvin's system. Point two, these guys, Steele and Thomas, they wrote some books about Calvinism. They are Calvinists. Quote, Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only. The elect only. And actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died, thereby guaranteeing their salvation. If I believe that, then I could not preach the Gospel whosoever will. And by the way, let me ask you a question. Was Jesus giving us a sham of a command when He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature? Why preach the Gospel to every creature when not every creature can respond? What would be the point of that? Why is the command to preach the Gospel universal covering every creature? And over and over again, as we're going to see in a moment, the teaching of the Bible is whosoever will may come, that Christ died for all, that His sacrifice on Calvary may be efficacious for all by the condition of faith. We're going to see that from the Bible in just a moment over and over again. What would be the point in our evangelical, evangelistic, and soul-winning attempts if first we, had to, first we had to tell somebody, you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't know if Christ died for you. Now, if I'm a Calvinist, I have to say that, to be honest. I have to go to Rick over here, who's still part of the non-elect. Rick, I hope we can get you elected by the end of the evening. <laughs> I have to go to Rick over here. Rick is a lost person. You work at White Castle, right, Rick? That's a wonderful place to work. Surely only the elect work there. <laughs> I love White Castle's. I go to the White Castle, I, 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 get a big, I get a big sack of 20. And that would just be for myself, to be honest with you right now. Just love them. Can't have them on the Atkins diet, but I love them. 
I get a big sack of 20 and I have a tract in my pocket and I'm about to take out the tract and hand it to Rick. If I'm a Calvinist, I cannot tell him that God loves him and be honest about it. Now, I'm just being, I'm being up front with you right now. I cannot say, Rick, here's a gospel tract that tells you how you can be certain you're going to be on your way to heaven. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ died for you? I cannot say that if I'm a Calvinist because I'm lying. I don't know that the Lord Jesus died for him if I'm a Calvinist. I know he died for the elect. And only if he's one of the elect, according to Calvin's system, did he die for Rick. I don't know that. And so really, I have to be, if I'm going to be an honest Calvinist, this is why, by the way, they don't preach in gospel missions. <laughs> if I'm going to be an honest Calvinist, I have to go over and I have to say, hey, you know, Rick, here's, here's the gospel tract. And if you're one of the chosen, the light bulb's going to go on the minute you see this tract and you're going to be drawn irresistibly. In fact, if you're one of the chosen, you're in like Flynn right now. Nothing I can do or you can do will affect it any way, shape, or form. Have a nice day. You say, Preacher, are you oversimplifying? No, I'm giving you an example so you can see practically where this doctrine leads. Okay? I tire of doctrine like this being pumped in the classroom into the eager young minds of college and seminary students who never translate it into real life who don't look into the eyes of someone who is just desperate because they've lived a life away from God, whose life is broken, who bears the mark of sin. They never feel a twinge of compassion for that individual. They never see that person as lost and dying and on his way to hell. By the way, may I make this statement? If human beings have the capacity for compassion over every lost sinner, do you think God is any less? God loves people. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. This is a very serious matter. 